On today's episode of The Interval, I am so excited to talk to Zonka Minen, the incredible virtuoso fingerstyle guitarist with influences from jazz, world and classical music. He really has acquired an outstanding reputation in the international guitar scene. So without further ado, we'll see you at the end. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to, to join me on this episode of our podcast, The Interval. It's great sure. to... It's great to finally chat to you. Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's kind of weird because I feel like I am looking at Wilmot Nickel. <laughs> yeah. I, I I now I have my glasses and I noticed that it's uh they look almost like yours. Um, yeah. Right. So it's, it's a bit like Tom Sands, Will McNichol. <laughs> oh my god! It's just a whole oh, wow. a whole world of confusion right now. Yeah. Yeah. I should, I, should, I should just say that um, I first became aware of, of you and your music through uh, Will McNichol. Ah, okay. Um, who, who, as we all know, is an is a absolutely phenomenal player. And he suggested that uh, I check you out, um, mm-hmm. which I did, and was, was kind of instantly uh, blown away by, by what I heard and, and, and what I saw. So I wanted to just kind of start with a kind of brief introduction, um, mm-hmm. into your journey into the guitar and, and when, when you kind of first picked up the guitar, was that your first kind of musical endeavor? Was the guitar your first instrument? Yeah, it was. I actually the the story is not that exciting. I just had like um, my dad had some guitars at home. He he was a music teacher and I just fooled around with them. And so I, I there were always guitars around. And I, I remember he had some uh, Leo Kotke LPs um, that were playing sometimes. So I, I got in touch with guitar music quite early. And then I got um, classical guitar lessons when I was eight, I think. Um, and I did that for quite a long time, but I was very lucky with my, my teacher. I had a great, a great teacher um, who was very open to other, other musical styles. And sometimes he would just show me some things on the mandolin or on the piano or whatever when we didn't feel like playing some Asturias or, or something like mm. that. So that was basically my first musical background. And then at some point, I like so many others, I discovered um, like fingerstyle players on YouTube, and uh, I got myself a steel string and was like copying them all the time. And I, I didn't have my teacher couldn't teach me anymore uh, at that time, so I, I had to find something for for myself. Um, what like kept me motivated, and uh, then I copied people like Tommy Manuel and all all these. Um, uh, all these players, and at some point, I met my um, I met some players who were uh, my professors later when I studied guitar, and they sort of um, told me that it makes no sense to only copy them. It's nice for a time to learn something, but uh, then I uh, in 2011 I moved to to Dresden where I'm still living, and um, here there's a kind of uh, this this music university here is not um, it doesn't have the strict uh, separation between classical guitar studies and jazz studies so um, for me it was always like if I want to study music then I, I should do it here because I was already composing a little bit and I wanted to be like creative write my own music and then I, I went to Dresden and here sort of these two backgrounds came together I first did a lot of classical stuff again in the studies and but then here it's all about um, composing, arranging, finding your own voice, your teachers for jazz, flamenco, all these different styles. And um, you can just pick all these inspirations and mm. uh, put together your own your own mix. And that was uh, quite helpful. So and it was also nice that I had already these two backgrounds of steel string fingerstyle and classical music. If I play steel string, I, I notice also that I play it totally different than I than I would play nylon string like the hand position and it's it's all a bit a bit different um but it's it's just nice to have both and it's I anyway I play the the nylon string now mostly and in, in, in most of my pieces and still it's um I take a lot of things I, I got from the steel string so it's it's sort of um blending slowly together to something I, more suppose, I, I suppose that 
Yeah, I, I guess that really informs your style and, and makes your style quite different. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about your your first album because to me mm -hmm. that really speaks of your um, your training and your kind of education in, in mm -hmm. all of these different styles. Um, that was a duo album with Philipp Wiechert, who's a, a great German jazz guitarist. And actually now we listen to it and we think like, oh, what did we do there? This is like totally, totally outdated. But um, uh, yeah, it, it was like the first um, thing where you, uh, like I met him here in Dresden, but it's really the, it's, it's quite funny. It's, it's, you can hear totally between that album um, and the album I did later, the, the solo album, the Perpetuum Mobile. Yeah. Um, that's sort of what describes very well uh, what happened in Dresden, if you listen to the difference, because the, the one I recorded in my first year of my studies, so nothing I did here was really in the music yet. It was, mm -hmm. it's, it's very, a very cool. Um, uh, if I listen to it now, yeah, that, that's, that's like the, the, the final recording I did with the, like the old musical self. And then there was this journey in Dresden and then I did the solo album. So that's, that's quite, um, quite interesting for me as well to listen to it. I didn't listen to it for a long time. I should do it again, maybe. Well, uh, well it is, it is yeah. really interesting because it's, yeah. it, the, the, the contrast is very, very striking. Yeah. The Philosophical Journey album yeah. that, that you, that you recorded, you know, it meanders between, you know, jazz and there's some folk and there's some yeah. Celtic stuff yeah, in yeah. there as well. And then you come in with uh, Perpetuum Mobile, mm. which which starts with the title track, which is yeah. like, boom, all right, <laughs> yeah. I'm here. Yeah. found yourself at that time um, and how you felt you'd you developed as a as a musician and, and as a composer as well mm -hmm. yeah it's I like it, it's a bit difficult to describe but it's it's more that if if I listen to the to the duo album um, it's like yeah there was there was a lot of vocabulary but the the grammar was not really there. That's a bit the feeling I, I have. So there's all these, as you said, all these different styles. And it's just, I just, we just put everything on there that just we arranged and did something and yeah, just put it on the album. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was a, quite a short time uh, and where we actually worked on the pieces. Uh, maybe maybe half a year or something. Some were solo pieces before, as far as I remember. And uh, we arranged it for the duo. Some we just wrote as a duo piece. And the album I did later with uh, the, the solo album, this is like four years of, of composing solo material and having all these new influences also. Like when, when mm -hmm. you are in Dresden, the, the thing, the good thing about the, the place here is actually that it's not only um, that it's the special kind of studies and it's about composing lessons and I, I get get more more influenced by the by composing teachers, but it's also because you can only study this here. Um, uh, all the students are from from all different parts of the world and have all these different backgrounds as well, and uh, I think that 
also uh, was very, very helpful for me. I studied together with people from uh, Brazil, Turkey, Czech Republic. I don't know, like a lot of different people who some were classical guitar players before, some did flamenco before they came here, some did jazz and they all came here to do something else again. And so that was quite helpful. And I think, um, yeah, it's just not only more uh, more vocabulary, more more inspiration in the in the um, in the album and the later and the solo album, but I, I sort of found a way to put it together to something that sounds like me and not just like a lot of different things on one album. I, I think uh, as well. So there's on on that album. Um, just looking at my notes here, you've also yeah. you've, you've, there's a few few different covers on there as well. You've got Night yeah. in Tunisia, you've got Long yeah. and Winding Road, yeah. and uh, uh, the Michael Jackson cover as yes, well. Exactly. Are they? Are they um, which is awesome, by the way. Um, are they? Are they kind of? Um, why did you choose to cover those tracks? Um, you know, why are those tracks on the album? Are they, is that speaking of your kind of more broad musical um, tastes and influences? Mm. Uh, maybe, yeah. It's uh, like right now I'm not really covering pieces anymore. I'm just composing a lot. But uh, of course, in the studies, you, you, you are playing a lot of different music and you're also um, trying to arrange different music. And I just wanted to pick like a few pieces. Um, it was actually not the plan to to put them on the album. Uh, I just recorded them and then it sounded good. And then I was like, okay, maybe I just put them on there. Um, but it's like one one pop song where it's like a good challenge to put all these different tracks of the Michael Jackson production, which is like 100 of them, like put on one guitar. And uh, then there's this, um, ballad from the Beatles which is totally different then there's uh, the Night in Tunisia is this jazz standard which is again totally different and I have this Brazilian piece Frevo um, which is a piano piece and I'm always very inspired by piano music to to put it on the guitar uh, mm-hmm. for some reason I don't even know why exactly but it, somehow it works very well for my style to to um, get some inspiration from the piano so I, I wanted to have like four very different pieces I I really spent time with arranging them and trying to to get some some inspiration for my own pieces from them. Um, yeah, so I just made made sure they were very different, and uh, then I, I I recorded them and they sounded good, and then they landed on the album at the end. Absolutely, no, yeah. and I, I think um, <laughs> that that really speaks of you as a as a composer and as as a musician mm-hmm. that you are able to take um, a. Sp- especially in, in, in the case of um, uh, Night in Tunisia and, mm. and Bad and yeah. the Beatles track as well. You've got these, yeah. these very popular and very well-known tunes that mm. you've you've been able to craft into something that's your own. But yeah. also, which I, something that I found which was really impressive is that you're able to play using different techniques and, and different styles in a way that's, that shows a kind of uh, virtuoso, but 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 isn't getting in the way of the the music. That's you know, for example, when I, when I was listening to Bad, um, you know, it, it almost sounds like you've got like a slap bass line going yeah, on there, which yeah, really yeah. really spoke to me as as mm. a bass player. You know, yeah. I really kind of appreciated that. And you know, there's a lot of the kind of percussive stuff going on as well. But mm. at, no, at no point did I kind of feel how I sometimes feel when listening to kind of percussive playing I never kind of wanted to cringe because it never it never kind of took over it never dominated it it only served to kind of support the, the piece I kind of wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on on virtuosity uh, and balancing that with with musicality and composition. Um, actually, it gets like virtuosity gets less and less important for me. It's it's a bit the thing people 
people know me for, I have the feeling. So I, I, uh, I very often hear these um, conversations like before I play a concert somewhere or I see announcement on, uh, announcements on Facebook and then it's, it's always about the guy who can play so fast. <laughs> that's a, mm. that's a, bit, a bit funny for me because now I, I, I did the other album that's um, with the violin player where it's not at all about playing fast. But um, Absolutely. yeah, it's uh, that's the thing. The, the music comes first. That's the, the, the very simple answer. Um, percussion can be a, a cool um, a cool thing uh, for maybe some accompaniment or also like I have these some some sometimes I play uh, in solo pieces. I play this very light percussion, like not drumming on the body, but I play just just a lot of death notes. Basically, mm -hmm. and um, so that's that's also something I I'm, I like to explore more right now. But it's it's not about the technique. It's just having a sound in mind first, having like writing a piece, and um, if you have like if you can imagine how it should sound at the end, and then your fingers will do something that's similar, <laughs> and then maybe some percussion percussive techniques will come out. But um, yeah, I first think about the composition and it should always also work without any gimmicks or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so that kind of leads me on to, to talking about composition and, and how you approach writing a, a piece. You know, where mm. does your inspiration come from? What's your start yeah. point? And do you have any kind of rituals or, or, mm. or things that you like to do to get into that space? Yeah. Um, does writing an album happen all at one time or is it something that you kind of amass over a period of a year or, or more perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it takes definitely more time than a year for me to, to record enough, uh, to, to write enough tracks for an, for an album. Um, and it's, it's very important for me to be in a space that is um, inspire, it's inspiring in some way. It, can be like for example here in my apartment I cannot really compose it's it's very hard for me it's um, it's quite quite a dark room and it's um, yeah I, I, I just I just know this space too well to to be inspired mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't know I, I sometimes when I'm when I'm on tour and I have some time and sometimes you play at some some quite beautiful places and there's like a uh, just recently, I was before a concert, just sitting at a, at a lake and ha having this nice view. And it sounds a bit cliche, but a lot of I, I could have written something there. Sometimes you have this feeling, okay, right now I could write something, and that's mostly when I'm in in a space that's I don't know that does something to me, and that's just um, just just inspiring. But actually, it it also can happen that I'm just fooling around on my guitar somewhere in a backstage, and I think like, oh, that was cool. And then there's also like a beginning of a song or something. Um, that's also possible, but that doesn't happen so much anymore because I, I think I'm playing guitar now for like 20 years or something. So um, it's very hard to to surprise myself on the instrument because I know all the all the notes <laughs> and how it, how all the chords and how it sounds. So that doesn't happen very often. Um, I now have a piano here, so I'm, I'm hoping a little bit um, when I just fool around on the piano that it gets easier if I don't know what I'm what am I actually doing there to um, to hit something that sounds cool and where I think like oh that could be a piece and then I would transfer to the guitar and then continue writing it. Um, so the idea can come from from everything basically, um, and then I like to to write that idea down to record it. And then um, really compose also on the on the laptop. Actually, recently I had this this technique. Then I I was just fooling around with with dead notes, and I um, well, had some I had some groove like something like that. I didn't play it today. Yet. <laughs> something like that. I was like, okay, this is That's kind great. of nice. And then. Uh, I just recorded it and I actually tried to, to write that pattern down in some way and then it developed from there and now it's like a five minutes piece. So that sometimes it happens still that I play the guitar and I, I can surprise myself, but uh, mostly it's not, not possible anymore. Um, so yeah, I like to be inspired from other instruments as well. Um, 
I'm, I'm not a good piano player, but uh, sometimes I just play something. And sometimes it helps that you don't know what you're doing. You're just listening. And that, mm -hmm. of course, doesn't happen on the guitar anymore. Um, but if you have a, a piano that sounds really nice and you're just pressing some keys, which is not very, very difficult, there's an, a good sound immediately. And, uh, and you listen and maybe you will hit some cool chords and whatever. And it's to, yeah, to get inspired for an idea, it's, um, that's the most important thing, of course. And then what you do after it's a, to a totally different story if you if you continue writing on the on the guitar or if you um, write it down and compose on your laptop, which I sometimes prefer um, to really get away from from the chords. My fingers know already, so um, yeah, that's that's basically how I how I do it. it. It can lead like so many different ways how how I write a song. Sometimes recently mm -hmm. I saw maybe you've seen that I saw a YouTube video of there's this. Um, Australian spider they recently discovered, which is like have, has this crazy mating dance, which is like a very oh, colorful right. spider. And they have some videos where they play like staying alive from the Bee Gees, and then you see the spider <laughs> running around. It's totally stupid, but I was like, okay, this maybe I should write some music that fits better to what I see there. And then I wrote like something inspired by that. So it, everything wow. can happen. It's just about being um, like. Yeah, being open to sure. that inspiration can like come from everything. That's but, so yeah. funny. So is that is that recorded? Is that is that available? For no, us it's to not not yet. Sunk I have a lot of sunk um, spider mating dance. Yeah. Not not yet. <laughs> no, I have a lot of new pieces right now, and um, of course nowadays it would maybe make sense to to do some releases like every few months or to to have some regular stuff to put out, but I. I'm not really a big fan of that. I like to uh, to just uh, collect pieces first and mm. then then select which ones make it on, onto the album and then like really take my time. And so I have like six, seven new solo pieces right now for a, for a new album. So I need some more. And I'm I'm also writing on on new music for the two duos I have with with Philip, who I did the the, the very first album with, and yeah. also with Bjarke, with my violin violinist. So it's also a question like which project has enough songs for an album first and oh, we'll just yeah. see that. But I'm, I'm happy to, to right now just compose and see what happens and wait to, to release something. It's it's quite a, a kind of a more traditional approach to, to writing and, and getting yeah. material together to create a, an album and a yeah. body of work that kind of speaks as, as a whole. Um, you know, I was talking to to Will McNichol the other day, and he was saying that he's he's increasingly feeling like he needs to go in the opposite direction, which is mm. releasing singles over a, mm. over a, a consistent um, yeah. period um, to try and um, get on board with you know like Spotify playlists and all exactly. this kind of thing as a exactly. as a way to kind of promote yeah. his music yeah more more widely and suggesting mm. that maybe that that model of creating the album um isn't maybe compatible with the way that people are consuming music um these days mm. is that is that kind of a um a struggle is is it kind of it's in conflict with what you want to do as a, a musician how do you how do you feel about that um it's a good question it's it's a bit of a conflict because i couldn't i i like to have i still love to have an album i now also have an lp so with with all the artwork and it's just like um just the whole thing it's um like it makes makes sense to hear it from the first to the last piece um, of course, yeah. but uh, maybe it's still possible to find a way in between. I know that like releasing singles and and all that is very good for for Spotify algorithms to to get on on playlists and uh, but still it, it might be possible to um, to release a whole album but maybe do like three pieces as a single before so you also have like a teaser for the album. And, sure. and find this this way in between and um yeah i think that's that's something i would i would do i, I also did it with the last album and was was working quite well um 
so yeah, we, we, we'll see. I, I didn't really think about that for for the next album yet because I'm not sure when it will be released. But all these things are changing so much right now, and who knows what new service there will be in two years and when when the album is ready. And so um, yeah, but of course it's important right now to to have that in mind. What what's happening with with Spotify and and all that. So I wanted to talk about um, your most recent album, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Postcards to Self? Yes, yes. Um, and I know that you do a lot of touring and a lot of traveling, and um, especially you've been spending quite a bit of time in China lately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there was one track on the album, Breeze and Curtain, which mm-hmm. which kind of, as soon as I heard it, it kind of drew me into the kind of uh, Eastern kind of vibes. It's got oh, really? kind of quite, okay. yeah, it's got, wow. I don't, I, it has a kind of um, almost kind of Chinese influencing sounding to it. And I just, uh, I wanted to um, ask you about the title to the album. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, wh- why is it a postcard to self? Is it speaking okay. of your journeys and, and travels or, or I totally missed the, uh, the mark there? Actually, actually, both the title track and Breeze of the Curtain are two two pieces uh, Bjarke wrote, so my my violinist. But it's it's ah. still uh, so that's interesting that you have that that picture. But um, like the the title of the of the album, um, I I try to to tell that story he normally tells in concerts. But he had this um, um, this moment when he moved back to the to the town where he grew up. And his his youngest son um, went to the same uh, daycare as as he was going uh, a lot of years earlier, and there were still like the same people working. And um, then they found an old picture of of Bjarke in the playground and showed it to his son. <laughs> and uh, then his his little son was like, "Oh, that's me," <laughs> but. That's not me. <laughs> I was a bit confused, and it was like this beautiful moment of like seeing yourself on the on the playground um i don't know how many years earlier but uh yeah and ha- having this idea in mind like if you could have written a postcard to yourself back then um like what would you write to yourself or what would you like like to know today about your past self so to say yeah and uh, that was this this idea we had for this for this piece of music we were writing at that time when when that happened and um so now we uh called the album like that and at concerts we also um like every audience member if it's not a very big audience then it's a bit difficult to do but at smaller concerts every audience member gets like this postcard and um can actually write it to they can write it to themselves and we have this envelope and our our custom stamp so we have this little uh, post office at the merch table and then it says <laughs> like do, do not open until and then you can close it and put a date in there and it's this nice idea to uh, yeah to um be like not to be part of all these stories that will happen automatically maybe but it's it's nice to give people these this opportunity what we thought would be would have been nice if like to to really yeah. know how it was sitting in this playground again what you smelled and felt and thought at that time so that was the idea behind this track and That's uh, really recently, nice recently we we met a guy at a concert who who um, took a leaf from the from the tree in front of the location put it in there and then wrote a postcard. It was really a ceremony for him. It was really moving. And then wow. we asked him, like, what, what date should we put on there? Um, to uh, Like, when when do you want to open it again? And then I, I forgot the exact year, but it was something like 40 years ahead. And, and this thought to be, like, part of this guy's life in 40 years when he opens the envelope is co- kind of nice and uh, yeah. so that's that's the the concept behind that behind that that's, uh, really, album. that's really wonderful i yeah. guess it's you know in a world where we're always distracted and uh, there's always something else happening somewhere else um mm. something like this really encourages somebody to to be in the moment and to yeah. really like you say take take notice of the what they can smell and what they can hear and, yeah, yeah yeah um that's that's a, that's a really beautiful um concept yeah 
Yeah, it's, it's it's very nice, and I'm I'm very curious. Like in some, most people write something on there, like in in ten, like a date in ten years, and I'm I'm really looking mm -hmm. forward to to see what's happening in ten years when they they open their envelopes. And, yeah. Well, I'll be I'll be really interested to see what that leaf looks like in uh, exactly, forty yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> Probably yes. Yeah. Completely disintegrated, yeah. and you know, yeah, maybe it's, it's got a little garden yeah. inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it could be. Good so let's 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 talk about um, the guitar itself, and let's talk yeah. about your or let's 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 nerd out on some okay. some <laughs> some gear talk. What are yeah. you what are you currently playing at the moment? What's your go to guitar? So my main guitar I have it here is uh, my Christina Kobler uh, nylon string crossover guitar. Let's uh, yep. see if I can put the screen a bit like this. Um, so it's it's quite a heavy guitar, um, which is also not very loud, but it sounds very beautiful. Uh, and it's um, it's a very good way to combine classical playing. If I play it acoustically, it's just a bit quieter than a classical guitar, but it still does everything I, I want it to do. It's, it's very sensitive and it's, I, I, I love it. And um, but still, it's also good for amplification, which was my main main goal to have a yeah. nylon string on stage that sounds big and doesn't have feedback all the time. And um, also, I I need it for some percussive things that I can just just drum on it and it, and it, nothing should break. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a it's a cool mix between a classical guitar and and a stage guitar and. Yeah, so that's that's the one. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, I've, I've been following Christina's work for a number of years now, and yeah. always, always been very impressed with with what I've seen. So, in, in mm -hmm. terms of um, you know what are, what are the back and sides on that? Is that a rosewood guitar? Uh, We've got a sit uh, top. That's um, Macasa Ebony on the back right. and sides. Uh, it's spruce top, and I actually don't know the rest. <laughs> Some koa bindings here. I'm not sure very very yeah no they're gorgeous a flamed yeah. color yes that's yeah. really really pretty and in terms of um what, what kind of pickups have you got in there what, what mm -hmm. system are you using i'm i actually i'm experimenting a lot with with pickups i had like seven or eight different pickups in this guitar already wow. and um right now i found a solution it's always the thing people ask me like what kind of pickups do you play and then i'm a bit it's good that I have have the opportunity to explain it a bit now because if people would just buy the pickups I play, put it in the guitar, plug it in, it wouldn't sound good at of all. Course. Because I have um, I do a lot of uh, equalizing and uh, on my on my board I have uh, an an Alabex Lyric microphone which is glued here under the top somewhere, and I have a Fishman piezo and I have like two two separate two separate outputs okay um, actually i should i should get my my board to to uh, show you what's happening with that um, so it's it's not very big luckily because i don't have so many toys on there it's basically eqs it's three different eqs um, so let's see Hope it will work via via Skype. Oh yeah. So wow, look at that. Um, okay, so I have the piezo, which goes. Uh, one second. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. It goes yeah, in yeah. here, and I have only the bass frequencies from the piezo. Everything else is totally down, and um, so it's only for to boost the bass a little bit. And the main sound comes from the microphone, which is EQ'd here. And you also see it's quite heavy EQing. Um, and it depends also very much on the guitar, how you would EQ it. Um, and then I, I blend it together in another box to one signal. And I have a third equalizer to um, adjust it uh, like for the, for the PA, because every PA system sounds so different. And sometimes you have to to cut out the highs. Sometimes you have to boost some mids or whatever, um, and then reverb. And that's that's basically my sound. How I can play play a whole concert with. Um, but it's all these this EQing 
um, that makes it sound good. It's definitely not like the Fishman is not the pickup that sounded the best on my guitar. Be but because I decided to only use the bass frequencies, I just decided to put in the pickup that um, has like the the strongest bass, and um, because I don't need the highs anyway. And that's all these experimenting. Um, if you would just put the Fishman piezo in there and the microphone and plug into your amp, it would sound like a very shitty, <laughs> cheap guitar. Probably. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, for for the um, just going back to the the guitar, um, you you do you do do a lot of percussion, but I don't see that you have any kind of scratch pads on there or anything like no. that. What, what does it have a, a a lacquered finish that guitar or? Um, good question. Yeah, it's it's it it has quite a like there's a lot of how do you say that <laughs> a finish on it, there. It's quite sure. Thick. It look. I mean, it looks it's just from, high, from high looking gloss. at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it looks like a sprayed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Finish just to protect that that spruce. Exactly, and um, yeah, but I I don't really care so much to be honest about having scratches on the guitar. This is very young still. It's like my old guitar has some more. Like I have two guitars by Christina, which is basically the same model, and. Um, yeah, so here are, if you look very closely, you would see some some little scratches, but it, uh, I'm, I'm also not drumming on the guitar so much. It's basically in, in two pieces in a concert, I use that. Um, but yeah, if it's if it looks used, I actually would like that. <laughs> so that's fine. I mean, it's, an, it's a tool, right? It's, yeah. Uh... And and how did you come across Christina's work? Is is she kind of local to you, or uh, actually well, not at all? How, how did you how did you come about choosing Christina as your luthier? Um, I was looking for this nylon crossover model for a for a long time, and I I, I found quite a, a few that were very interesting to me, and um, then at some point I, I met Christina actually on a on a Tommy Emanuel concert in Dresden where she was in the audience uh, it was just this this nice uh, like I didn't expect to meet her it was not really planned but she was traveling here and then um, I invited her to um, be part of the exhibition at my festival and then she was there and brought her prototype of the nylon crossover and then I, I tried it and it was like almost what I wanted and then I we met and um, changed a few details like mainly just measurements and mm -hmm. um, then uh, she built her the, the first the first crossover uh, actually I have her her first nylon crossover here and her last until now so that's that's quite funny that's um, yeah yeah, uh, I, I really like I say I've, I've been following her work for for a number of years now, and and we always seem to miss each other at shows. Okay. Um, so hopefully, hopefully one of these days I'll I'll get to try one of one of her her guitars. Yeah. Um. Where where can people hear this guitar? Is it is it was it? Did you use it on your last um album? Uh, the last two albums were you were recorded with uh, with the other guitar I have from Christina, which is um the same basically. Um. This one is. For me, the, the new one sounds just a tiny bit better, but it's it's not a big difference. And uh, yeah, so so people can can if if they listen to especially the the last album I did with with Bjarke, I think that there the the sound of the guitar is captured quite quite well. The one before too, um, like this the the new album is a bit more um, it's a bit less pickup and it's it's more the the actual guitar sound mm -hmm. it's a bit more more my, uh, use of the microphones um because it was like for the solo guitar I, I needed this more powerful sound and for the duo it was it just felt better um yeah but did these two albums are with the christina guitar Fantastic. And where 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 can people see you play this guitar? Have you got any tours coming up? I know you're going to be at uh, the Ullapur Guitar Festival yeah. um, in in October. Actually, yeah, this this autumn is quite quite busy. It's um, like every year, autumn is is the touring season. Um, I have uh, now some 
some concerts coming up. Now I play with, with Bjarke uh, at a duo concert in, in the south of Germany, like on, on Friday, I think, um, and uh, on the border to Switzerland. And then I go to Allepool to, to Scotland. And um, after that, I have my first tour in Russia, which is quite exciting. Wow. I'm not, not sure what to expect there, but I'm sure it will be great. Uh, seven concerts, I think, or six. And then I go back to Germany and in um, November I play a few festivals in, in Germany. And then it gets less less busy. A few things in, in December, but like three or four or something. And then in the beginning of the year I, I always try to um, not play much. I have a few concerts in February, but um, January, I, I also this year I kept totally free to have some, some time to, to compose and be creative. And, do all that fantastic so very very busy um lots of interesting things happening yeah. for you in the in the coming in the coming year um mm-hmm. so i have one one last question for you yeah sure um and then and then i'll let you enjoy <laughs> your day um if we were to have a, a dinner party tonight and you're allowed to bring one guest um it can be anyone that you like living or dead past present or future it can be a <laughs> fictional character <laughs> who who would you bring and why? Wow. Okay. I've never. Sometimes you're lucky that you had this question before in your life. Somebody asked you yeah. that, but but this one is a new one, so I have to have to really think about that. Um, I can already tell you it wouldn't be a guitarist, <laughs> because I am around so many guitar players and sure. guitar nerd people and I love every moment where I can talk with with normal people <laughs> and, um, <laughs> tell me about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh yeah I don't know um I'm not spontaneous enough this morning to answer that I'm not sure <laughs> maybe it would be like a, a, a person from the past like Bach or something still a music musician but to just nerd around on a different level and just like learn a lot but that I, would I'm be not, that would be next level yeah i'm not sure I'm not it's sure a, about it's that. a very it's a very difficult question yeah yeah um i, I, I think about that the whole day now and maybe write you yeah. later who it would be perfect, perfect. maybe, that, that be, maybe it would be a guy the guy who who put the leaf in the envelope but in 40 years uh, that would yeah that, that I mean, wouldn't would that be something good. that would be good <laughs> Well, Sonka, thank you so much um, for taking the time this morning to chat to me. Thank you. Um, so much. It's been great. It's it's been great to meet you via Skype, and and hopefully it won't be too long uh, before we get to meet in person. Um, so on that note, I will bid you a good day, and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Do you too? Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interval with the awesome Zonka Mining. If you haven't already hit subscribe, what are you waiting for? We are on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and now on TikTok as well. See you next time.